Good evening. I'm Bernard Green, Chair of the Brookline Select Board and the Chair of the Select Board Committee on Policing Reform. Tonight, the Policing Reform Committee and the Select Board Task Force on Reimagining Policing are holding a joint public hearing and listening session to hear from residents and non-residents their ideas, complaints, suggestions, or other comments regarding the two committees or anything else on your minds. We have been receiving letters and emails from residents and non-residents alike supporting the, BP, the Brookline Police Department and being critical of them. These letters and emails will be considered important data that we will factor into uh, our recommendations to the select board and will be available with any additional uh, correspondence received on the town's website. The Police and Reform Committee was designed with a number of purposes in mind. First, an educational purpose, to provide the community with some basic facts about the Brookline Police Department and its programs in the community other than traditional policing duties. Second, to review the programs and operations of the Brookline Police Department in order to identify areas where improvements could be recommended. And third, to come up with recommendations to the select board in a final report or periodically as the work of the committee progresses. The committee's role is to improve on what I believe is a good, but not yet perfect police department. We may recommend some reallocation of resources or reformulation of programs, but in any event, based on data, not uninformed opinions or secondhand information. Long-term, we hope to come up with good, actionable recommendations to the select board that will significantly improve the Brookline uh, Police Department. The reimagining task force may come up with more far-reaching proposals, and Mr. Fernandez will discuss those uh, shortly. The Reform Committee has organized our work into four ongoing subcommittees. Personnel Structure and Mission, Accountability slash Civilian Complaints, Civil Rights, Militarization, and Mass Events, and Community Outreach, Youth, and Non-Traditional Roles. The precise work of these uh, subcommittees could be influenced by the comments from the, publics, from the public uh, this evening. So make sure your comments are really focused. In addition, a short-term subcommittee on online educational programming is currently producing educational videos and fact sheets that, are, that will be posted to the Reform Committee's web, web page as they are ready. Two weeks ago, the committee approved a proposed chokehold ban to the select board. That ban will be taken up at a public hearing during the select board's Tuesday, October 7 meeting. Now this is a listening session primarily. What do you want the committees to do? What complaints do you have regarding policing in Brookline? What suggestions do you have for the town or anything else on your minds? Uh, all comments are welcome. To have an impact, it is recommended that your comments be pre presented in a respectful and constructive manner. Uh, Next, uh, Mr. Fernando you, uh, Fernandez, do you want to, um, to introduce your side of this hearing? And then we'll sure uh, proceed to take comments from the public. Sure thing. Um, thanks, uh, Chair Green. Uh, and and I, um, I join you uh, in, um, in calling for a, for a respectful, civilized uh, uh, conversation tonight. Uh, and, I, and I also hope that, um, that it's an honest one. Um, you know, so uh, let me restart. Good evening, everyone. I'm Raul Fernandez, a select board member and chair of the task force to reimagine policing in Brookline, uh, which was established in July by a unanimous vote from the select board. Uh, our charge is to explore and recommend new approaches to public safety and policing in Brookline. Uh, the charge of the task force included membership diversity requirements, and I'm proud that this group not just meets but exceeds those requirements, uh, and many of those group members are with us tonight. Uh, of our 11 voting members, there are six members of color, including three Black, one Latinx, and two Asian members, as well as five women and one transgender member. Uh, 
Immigrants and one Brookline Housing Authority resident are also included among our members. As a group, we represent a wide variety of ages, identities, and experiences. We work well together and we're all committed to presenting thoughtfully considered workable proposals. We're also thankful to have staff support, which includes Town Administrator Mel Kleckner and numerous department heads. And we're very thankful to have Devin Williams uh, supporting us uh, throughout this endeavor. Uh, the full task force meets every Friday morning from 8 to 10 a.m. These meetings are all publicly accessible on Zoom, cable, and the web through Brookline Interactive Group and are also recorded and posted on the big YouTube page so you can go back and catch up on our work. To date, we've received presentations from former Chief Dan O'Leary, our police liaison on the structure and operation of the department, as well as a briefing on the most recent crime data and 911 calls. At last week's meeting, we established subcommittees focused on conducting a holistic analysis of the department and individual units like the walk and talk unit and school resource officers as well as exploring alternative approaches to supporting vulnerable people and people in crisis. Uh, we also have a subcommittee focused on envisioning and community engagement, which was not involved in crafting this hearing, but will be leading uh, our future task force efforts to engage the community, especially those who've been disproportionately impacted by policing. Uh, the task force is used, utilizing a data informed approach and an important element in that work is understanding the experiences and perspectives of members of the public especially those for whom Brookline's current model is not working. Uh, we look forward to hearing from the public in Brookline and beyond and using what's shared in this hearing and other forums to help guide our work. Uh, before we begin, I think it's important to, to recognize why we're here. Uh, the most recent national push for police reform and reimagining of course comes in the wake of the racist murders of, by police of George Floyd and so many other black people and people of color. But as many learned this summer at this summer's protests and in public comments of the select board, there are issues here too. Um, and we as an overwhelmingly white and allegedly progressively community, progressive community have to reckon with the fact that anywhere you go in this country from its inception to today, the power of policing has been disproportionately wielded against communities of color in a way that most pe white people simply have not confronted or truly understand. Um, I'm mindful that some may appear tonight to speak glowingly of the police department. To them, I would say, I believe that's been your experience. Um, what's already clear is that there are many for whom our current model works brilliantly. Um, the work of the task force, however, would benefit most from hearing from those uh, for who are, whom our current model is inadequate uh, and may through pre-existing pre design or neglect perpetuate racist systems. Um, I don't know that we're going to hear all those stories tonight. These are traumatic stories, um, and I don't know that we're going to hear them told in such a public forum, but I heard many of them at this summer's protests and privately, and we'll seek them out through the work of our task force. I do hope that those listening know that even if you don't feel comfortable speaking tonight, there is a safe way to share your story. Please be in touch with me, and I'll make sure you're heard. Um, in the meantime, I look forward to hearing what everyone has to say tonight. Um, so thanks, and let's begin. Okay, Devin, you want to start off with, uh, okay, we have a number of people who have uh, uh, written in uh, to be uh, speakers, and we'll take those first, but uh, if, you're in, if you want to um, make a comment and haven't uh, uh, written to Devin, uh, you can use the hand raise function in the Zoom box, and uh, we'll call on you as, as, uh, as time comes, goes on. The first person signed up for public comment is Susan Howard. Susan, you've been promoted to a panelist and your three minutes will begin when you're ready. Okay, can you all hear me? Good evening, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, you sound great. Thank you. I'm going to be really, really brief. I'm a longtime resident of Brookline. I'm a criminal defense attorney with an office on Washington Street. I practiced in the Brookline courts for 30 years. 30 years ago, I attended a Harvard lecture led by Sarah Buell lawyer, activist, survivor. My concern is domestic violence. Her first words at the lecture were, if you have never been abused, consider yourself blessed. There are rumors floating around town, and I hope they're only rumors, that there's some suggestion that domestic violence will be taken from the police department and given to other departments in the town. I am strongly suggested that this is a really bad idea. It's taken us 30 years to have domestic violence defined as a crime, to have restraining orders issued almost regularly with, without much ado. The police are the only ones in the town who are really trained and equipped to deal with such volatile situations. There are certainly room for 
counselors, social workers, psychologists later on, but as far as first responders, domestic violence should be left with the police. I will also say that given the um, people who do this work every single day, there will be quite an outcry if any changes are made to the domestic violence situation. In addition, the police have established relationships with the district attorney's office, with the sheriff, with probation, with the courts. So there's a chain. I hope that both of the committees in looking at police reform or police reimagining, I don't really understand what that means, reimagining, um, are also going to be in touch with those um, agencies, with the sheriff, with the district attorney, with the courts. That's the first thing. The second thing I'm assuming as a resident that you've all done your due diligence and that your recommendations will not just be um, based on data, but you have on the boots experience that you've attended the stakeholders meetings the police hold. You've attended the open houses and de-escalation and um, crisis intervention, that you've attended the domestic violence roundtable, you've attended an arraignment in the court or a restraining order and other such, uh, and the CERT program. These are fabulous programs that we have in the town. You may not agree with them all the time, but you at least as members of these committees have done your due diligence. Last of all, and this is directed at the reimagining committee, it seems to me from what you've said and what I've read, and I may be wrong, that you are focusing on those programs that build security, safety, and help survivors of crime in, in our town. I don't see much focus on what's going on nationally. I assume the focus should be and is on the Brookline Police Department, but make no um, mistake, what's going on nationally has affected every single one of us, but our focus is the town of Brookline. Those are my suggestions. You can take them or leave them, but I will say that on domestic violence, we will be back. Thank you all. Thank you. The next person signed up for public comment is Rita McNally. She'll be speaking in her capacity as chair of the Domestic Violence Roundtable. Uh, Rita, you can unmute by pressing star six. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you for having this public uh, hearing. I'm presently the chair of the Domestic Violence Roundtable, and I appreciate all that Susan has presented to you. I have some other comments to make about our Domestic Violence Roundtable. We meet uh, the first or second Thursday of every month at 4 o'clock, and people are welcome to join in uh, at our meetings. Uh, what Susan said that struck me most is the value of the support system that we build uh, with the detectives and also with Doreen Gallagher, who is an advocate uh, and works for the police in that capacity. I haven't yet met the social worker that works there, but they form a team, which means that when a woman uh, or male or young person uh, calls 911 and gets involved with the police in the domestic violence uh, crime. Uh, the police are the ones that we want to have at the forefront uh, because people have to realize the dangers that are in these very volatile situations that involve families. And we don't want this moved out uh, to another uh, activity in another branch of uh, town government because I think it's working very well because uh, we have no safe house in Brookline, as you're all aware, I'm sure. And the police know places that are safe for the woman, if it's a woman, and her children to uh, get them out of the uh, violent cycle uh, until uh, activities calm down and uh, steps can be taken to place the children and the parent in safety and to uh, get the perpetrator uh, into a, a place where he can find help as well, whether it's jail or whatever happens with them. We also at the round table provide education and trainings for uh, people that are involved in it. And we exchange information from many communities and departments of state so that we can give the information back and forth and provide that type of uh, training for the community uh, to make it a safe place. Uh, I also wanted to uh, bring up uh, four items of my own experiences seconds, with yeah. the police. 
Okay. And one is the rotary, and this involves Captain Gropman, who helped the rotary. You know what the pancake breakfast is like and the mob that comes there. Well, Captain Gropman helps set up on a Friday night, uh, helps uh, make the uh, dough for the pancakes, anything that we've ever had to ask for help, lifting boxes, the most humble kinds of things. And then the next day he shows up to help make the pancakes and uh, cook them. Uh, and if you... Okay. All right. And then the Women's Commission clothing drive with Sergeant Casey Hatchett, uh, where we provide uh, uh, the uh, activity room at the police station to collect clothing so that we can present it to people who need it, uh, both in this community and outside the community. And we also uh, gather winter jackets for kids in need. And uh, the Human Relations Commission that used to be with Lieutenant Peter Scott and Brookline, under his guidance, became a no place for hate when there was uh, so much anti-Semitism that was uh, being raised up in various communities. And the last okay. is... Ms. McNally? Yeah? Uh, wrap wrap up, please. Do what? Uh, wrap up, please. Oh, okay. Anyway, I feel that uh, we should keep the domestic violence roundtable uh, where it is with the police's activity and the kinds of commitment that we've made so that we have a safe place where we can share ideas and comments. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, by the way, Ms. McNally, uh, you can write out your comments and send it to us, and they'll be posted on our website. Okay. Thank you. But we are trying Good to luck. we are trying to encourage people to just spend three minutes so that uh, we'll get uh, give everyone a chance to speak. You mean I can't tell you of the uh, uh, Detective Thomas O'Leary who okay, saved wait, my wait. life you, when I had a stroke? Write, Goodbye. Write it, write it down. <laughs> The Goodbye. next person signed up for public comment is Neil Wyshynski. Neil, your three minutes will begin when you're ready. Hi, everybody. Uh, Neil Wyshynski, town meeting member, Precinct 5. I'm speaking mainly to the reimagining committee, but my remarks really apply to both committees. I think I heard Select Board uh, member Fernandez previously say that the reimagining committee is not interested in hearing what the department is doing right, so I won't do that. But I thought it would be most productive in laying out some things I think the committee should consider. Police department works in a number of format, a uh, number of contexts. First and, format, first and foremost, we have the expectations of the citizens of the town. They want to feel and be safe. They want assurance that when they dial 911, something is going to happen fast. Typically, these are the worst moments in a person's life and the police department needs to be there. So whatever you do, you cannot negatively impact the ability of the department to serve in its role as first responder. The next context is state law. It provides a legal framework and limitations on the town. I know there's a reform package on Beacon Hill, but until that's passed, our, in some respects, our, our hands are tied. And even after it's passed, our hands will still be tied. The next context is civil service. It dictates how officers are hired, promoted, and disciplined. One thing you can explore is what are those limitations and how they impact being able to have the kind of department we want. The big question is, should we stay in civil service? Many cities and towns have left civil service, should Brookline. And last, we have the union contract. Conditions of employment need to be bargained, and the union has a right to involve to invoke compulsory arbitration under certain circumstances. So we could be subject to the whims of an arbitrator if we don't have agreement. We can't forget that. The union needs to be at the table. In our form of government, to do anything big, there must be a broad consensus. The recommendations must be practical and achievable, and citizen service expectations must be met. And if you're going to recommend a reduction or shifting of funding, we need to know the impact on the department, what services are affected, and how those services will be delivered. Without considering the context and the need for broad consensus, you risk producing a report that looks nice, sounds good, but in the end, will just sit on a shelf. Thank you. 
The next person signed up for public comment is Felina Silver Robinson. Felina, you have been promoted to a panelist. And your three minutes will begin whenever you're ready. Dear select board members, task force members, and Brookline friends and neighbors, policing and reform in Brookline is serious business. We are talking about making major changes that will affect many lives and there will be no going back for some. I'm fearful of the idea that aforementioned committee and task force members have been considering the removal of such key programs that have been instrumental in so many of our children's lives throughout the town. I'm certain that the majority of the people reading this email, which was attached in the pamphlet, well, I'm sorry, in the packet, um, has had some family member that has utilized one or more of these services, myself included. Um, I've listed some of the items that are being discussed by the Select Board Task Force to reimagine policing in Brookline, the Select Board Committee on Police Reform, and the groups in Brookline, which are outlined in the email. I won't, I won't list them so that we can save time. I think it would be a grave mistake to take the role of the Brookline police in the community to, to remove the role of the Brookline police in the community from the community. We are not like other communities. There may, there may be unforeseen repercussions that there is no returning from. There may, there may also end up being a decreased value in property value as people move away, as they're unhappy because of the choices the town has made. The fear due to the lack of safety, the lack of programming, the list goes on to the endless possibilities. Change does need to happen here. Relationships do need to be fostered. Ears need to be opened. Younger people do need to have a voice and older people do need to listen. Race is a problem here. I am a person of color. I have lived here 54 years of 57 years of my life now. I am proud to say that, disappointed that we are where we are right now. I know we can fix it. I pray that we do. Defunding is not the answer, nor is the removal of the Brookline Police Force. I do agree with Rita McNally and Susan Howard with regards to the domestic violence program. I am a so proud survivor. Seconds. I am a proud survivor. Um, of that situation. And I think that we benefit from having that unit as a part of the Brookline Police Department. Thank you. Thank you. The next person signed up for public comment is Tanya Gorlin. Tanya, when you're ready, your three minutes will begin. Yes, I'm ready. I'll start with you. All right, go ahead. Uh, my name is Tanya Gorlin. I'm a resident of Brookline for 30 years, living at 28 Marshall Street. I am appalled to know that there is a discussion, a given demand to defund, to defund police in Brookline. The very word defund, the police, the only department in the town of Brookline to which it's ever been applied looks to me a little bit offensive. I recently subscribed to local news channel on my phone, and I am terrified to see how many awful crimes our police has to deal with. Domestic violence, murder, rape, burglary. Our police officers often see people at their worst, and they still believe in humanity. I applaud them for that, and I truly believe we must support our police. I, ne I, I have never heard any complaints about Brookline Police, which has the reputation of exemplary organization. One of the proposal is eliminating position of a social worker within police department and transfer funds to another entity outside police department. 
To me, it doesn't make sense. In majority of cases that initially appears non-violent can easily transfer into situations that would require police involvement. And now it is about us, Brookline residents. Is it fair to put us at risk by defunding police and forcing them to close essential programs which keeps us safe? I believe a present setting works very well. What the urge to change it? Thank you very much. The next person signed up for a public comment is Farshid Farista. <laughs> Good evening. Pre-COVID, one of my neighbor's kids came home from school and found the door to their home to be open. They called their dad. And the dad did not call me. They didn't call the other neighbor. I highly doubt they called you. They called the police. The police was there in a matter of a few minutes. They went inside their home, checked everything, made sure the home was safe and secure for the kids. That's what Brookline Police does for our community. We are a small community surrounded by Boston and all the problems that Boston brings for us. But we've done a pretty good job. I've been a resident of Brookline for the past 20 years or so. Most of it, I've been a member of the CERT program with Casey Hatchett being here, who was one of the founders of it. I have been involved with the Boston Marathon bombing where we supported the uh, evacuation of the routes. Every year, the Boston police supports the, uh, the marathon runs, uh, the, the CERT program, and the numerous other programs that they do based on whether it is uh, online crimes or internet crimes and everything else that they do that I am not privy to. But what I do know is that Brookline police, as others spoke before me, they say, it is an exemplary department. And I hope, as Susan said, we're not being swayed by the media or other outlets to take away the good policing that our department does. Is there room for improvement? Absolutely. In my work, my full-time job, I go through a training called sexual harassment training. Every year they have a bias training. I don't see why if if it's not on an annual basis, it, perhaps more frequently, the police department could go through that. I highly doubt they're not doing it. It could be continued, whether it is sexual harassment training, racial slash bias, um, uh, racial bias training. It is the uh, policing without excessive force training. And all of that will happen, not by defunding the police, but by defending the police. And all of this in talk is great, but it has to show up somehow on some sort of a budget sheet. That is the way we can easily make sure our police stays exemplary. You have 30 seconds. To provide the level of service that we have come to expect in Brookline. Thank you for your time. The next person signed up for public comment is Amy Takanami. Hi, Amy Takanami, she, her, hers, precinct 10. I'm a alumni of Brookline High School, class of 2012. I wanna first take the opportunity to thank both committees for making the time for people to publicly share their personal stories as it relates to policing in Brookline. Too often in the course of this past spring and summer, we've heard members of our community from select board members to neighbors express the belief that people like myself who have advocated strongly and consistently to reimagine and defund police are actively naively at best and in bad faith at worst. There has been an inconsistent thread throughout the, this time that those of us who believe the problems of policing in America exist in Brookline as much as Minneapolis are not connected to the reality of our police department that our demands are unserious, unwarranted, and ungrounded. 
Despite the many times I've challenged these ideas publicly, I have not related any of them to my personal experiences because I don't believe that should be necessary in order to be taken seriously on this issue. And because I don't believe relating such experiences will actually change the minds of the people who have dismissed my viewpoint long ago. But I wanted to share my personal experiences tonight because I know there are many others, members of our community who have felt and seen the violence of Brookline police who don't feel comfortable or safe relating those experiences publicly and understandably so. If I feel able to share my story and if in doing so, we may move ever so slightly towards a Brookline free from police violence and I believe I have a responsibility to do so. My dad struggles with severe mental illness, which is exacerbated by the racism and classism in this town and country. I spent much of my time in high school worried that every police car with sirens on had picked up my dad in the midst of a mental health crisis. That every unknown phone call I received would be my dad locked up behind bars under the control of an armed police officer who couldn't understand what he was saying or where he was coming from. There is no good reason why families like mine should be given a mental health system in which someone with a gun and handcuffs shows up at our doors when we are at our most vulnerable. The fact is that a better system, a better community, and a better world are possible. But so far, we have collectively made the decision to meet suffering with cruelty and crisis with violence. We have made the decision to offer people like my dad armed police intervention instead of culturally competent and financially accessible mental health services. Instead of investing in adequate public housing, we've decided on a system where my dad's paranoia is intensified by a broken front door lock that Brookline Housing Authority refuses to fix until we are out of all other options but the police. With every budget, every town meeting, Every election, we've decided that families like mine don't deserve health care or housing, but more police, more guns, more fear. The spring uprisings that took place across the country are giving us a chance to break the cycle of suffering and cruelty and allow people to live without the constant threat of police violence. I want to be clear, this does not mean more funding for police sensitivity training or to get officers with social work degrees. It means to stop throwing money away at bloated, ineffective, and inherently violent and racist police departments and towards the things families like mine actually need. Housing, healthcare, food, work, education. We don't need to spend money making a more humane police department. We need to build a more humane Brookline. Thank you. The next person signed up for public comment is Anthony Meyer. Anthony, you may unmute. When you're ready, your three minutes will begin. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, and thanks, Amy, for sharing your perspective. Um, I really appreciate your courage. Uh, my name is Anthony Meyer. Good evening. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, his. I'm the head of school at Brookline High School. This is my 17th year at BHS and fifth in this leadership role. I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak at tonight's hearing about the role of our school resource officer and to address some concerns I have heard about the location of the SRO's office within BHS. While this statement hopefully contributes to the important work of the task force to reimagine police in Brookline and the Select Board Committee on Policing Reforms, I also want to make clear that I offer myself and anyone from BHS to meet with either or both groups if our perspective on ongoing work with the Brookline Police and within our, within our larger community would be helpful. For background, our school resource officer started in February 2019 after lengthy MOU discussions between BPD and the public schools of Brookline. Though there are many aspects of our, SO, or our SRO's work, I'd outline three general ways we coordinate efforts between the police and schools via our school resource officer and more generally through our collaboration. One, we prevent violence involving BHS and PSB students and families. Two, we prevent use, abuse, and distribution of alcohol and other controlled substances involving our students. Three, we promote a safe and nurturing environment in our school community. We do all this work together, making clear the distinct roles that SROs and school administrators have. We also do so with a sharp focus on keeping young people out of the criminal justice system wherever and whenever possible. There are myriad aspects of this ongoing collaboration. And again, I make myself available to speak to these 
field questions, and hear feedback and concerns, suggestions in the days ahead. When we sought to locate Officer Keneally at BHS during the 1920 school year, it was our responsibility as a high school to find and assign that space. Our ass assistant head of school and I saw a few options and decided on an office in the center of the school near our atrium next to an egress to the quadrangle and greeno and generally accessible for our SOO or RO and for individuals in our school who need access to her. You have 30 no seconds. Okay, At, thank you. At no time did I or any BHS leadership, um, sorry, um, at no time did I or anyone choose this space due to its proximity to our METCO, African American Scholars Program or Steps to Success Program. Indeed, all of these essential BHS programs are also located at the heart of the school. I want also to be clear that at no time did I or any BHS leaders discuss with our police partners the desire to surveil students of color with the location of Officer Keneally's office. The mere thought of this saddens me, and I'm sorry that anyone believe, would believe that to be true. I mention all of this because these questions and concerns were relayed to me over the last couple of weeks. My goal is to speak honestly and directly this evening and always. All that said, I did not and absolutely should have communicated and collaborated with the leaders of these essential programs about locating our SORO next to or close to them. As head of school, I take responsibility for this lack of process and conversation. Thanks to feedback from our BHS METCO coordinator, Malcolm Cawthorn, and the work of this task force and select board committee, we are currently engaged in this conversation. Officer Keneally has made very clear her openness to, openness to move office locations, if that is what's right to support our students of color. In fact, Mr. Cawthorn, Officer Keneally, Dean of Students Lisa Redding and I met this morning and are seeking, seeking to widen the circle and involve the leaders of our Scholars and Steps program next week. This should have happened in- Did for a minute. Okay. This should have happened- for go, go ahead, sorry. Sorry, I just wanna check in with the chairs. Uh, do you want to let Mr. Meyer finish? Yes, please. Thank you. Sorry okay. to be over time. Um, okay. This should, should have happened in 2019, and it is happening now thanks to open dialogue and our shared focus on safekeeping and supporting our 2,000 plus students. I do wish to emphasize that neither my deans nor I have heard a single complaint about Officer Keneally's work at BHS. She is committed, caring, and also able to help young people understand boundaries and ways to stay safe and out of trouble. Officer Keneally continues to collaborate with high school staff in ways that offer students diversionary paths and avoid police or legal trouble. She builds relationships with kids who don't trust easily, and that is because she is genuine and awesome. And let me be real for a moment. I think we all know high school students are especially awesome because they see through adult BS, any and all of it, uh, with superhero-like powers. Our students trust Caitlin because she is trustworthy. More seriously, high school leaders are aware of that and uh, uh, that a police officer's presence within a high school raises questions and can negatively impact even traumatized students, especially as they return to school from an incredibly challenging and scary spring in so many ways. Officer Keneally is sensitive to this as are high school leaders. I welcome the chance to engage in dialogue with either the task force to reimagine policing or the select board committee on police reforms. If further and wider conversations and collaboration is needed to keep our young people feeling and being safe and supported, I will do whatever I can to contribute. Thank you so much. The next person to provide public comment is Tanya Gorlin. I think I may have missed her in the original run, so I want to be sure uh, that her comment is. Uh, Devin, let me just say something, Devin, uh, before we go on. Um, Ms. Meyer, uh, uh, if you want to, you can submit your written remarks to the committee, as can anyone else. Um, but since you're a significant um, person in the schools, I really encourage you to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Happy to do that. Yeah, well, I may have, I have, um, Tanya Gorlin has already spoken, so. Okay, I, cool. yeah. great. 
That means that we are on to Svetlana. Svetlana, you've been promoted to a panelist. Your three minutes okay. will begin when you're ready. I am. <clears throat> Do you hear me? Yes. Okay, I have <clears throat> I have been a resident of Brookline for more than 20 years, always felt safe and secure here, and thanks to our local police, and I want to continue feeling that way. I don't know exactly what this re-imaging of police task force means, I don't know all the programs, but I have a feeling that essentially it's about cutting the funds given to the police. In my view, the reduction of the funds can be justified in two cases. If there are too many people in the police force or we're paying them too much. I have a proof that the first reason is not true. Three months ago, I was trying to organize an appreciation of police rally in front of Brookline police station. And the chief of police asked me not to do that, given the reason quote unquote, that, you know, you will have a lot of protesters, it can turn wild, and we don't have enough people to protect neither you nor ourselves. Are we paying them too much? You know, their job is not only very dangerous, but also, honestly speaking, not very pleasant. They see the very unpleasant and dark sides of human nature, and they do it every day in order to feel gratified, they need to be appreciated by public and they need to be well compensated. Otherwise, we'll not see many people entering the police academy next year. And we already see people retiring early and quitting the force, right? So uh, nowadays, police uh, force is losing both appreciation, respect, and money. Police are sued. They are demonized in media, they are criticized, they are being shot and by, by violent protesters, and on the top of it, each city and town is competing in their efforts to reorganize it, to defund police. I don't understand this. Is it a new fashion? And why are we doing that? Why are we trying to punish our honest and brave officers of our local police forms for the crimes committed by someone else thousand miles away. I don't understand this. I came... It, Just 30 it, seconds. Yeah, I came from a lawless country with the corrupt police. I know very well the value of law and order. Practically all immigrant families are on the side of the law enforcement. And I totally demand that no defunding of our police form takes place in our town. Thank you. The next person signed up for public comment is Annabelle Lane. Annabelle, you've been promoted to a panelist. You can unmute and share your video. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Annabelle Lane. I am a and the social worker in the Brookline Police Department. Um, I wanted to join this to introduce myself and make sure people know that I exist and talk a little bit about my role. So. Um, I'm based at the police station. I work with people in the community who come into contact with the police for reasons related to mental health or substance use issues. Um, I work with individuals and families to help them stabilize and try to resolve the underlying issue that um, led to the crisis or, or the reason that the police were called in the first place. And I try to connect people to longer term services and support. Um, with the goal of preventing future um, interactions or, or need for police response. So part of that includes going out on calls with the police as needed, um, you know, as requested by them. And then a little more than that, I do more following up with people after the fact to try to resolve the underlying issue. And um, this takes time and, and is more than an in the moment response. Um, it's very much a collaborative effort with the officers. I could not do my job without them. Um, a lot of the mental health related calls that we get are 
um, from people who don't necessarily see mental health as their primary concern. Um, so that's one of the challenges that I think doesn't always get recognized in the conversation around this issue. Um, and also there are a lot of people who have had trouble accessing um, or staying engaged in our traditional mental health service system. Um, there are a lot of barriers to care that I could spend a long time talking about. Um, the other part of my role is I co-coordinate a regional training center for mental health and substance use response. Um, my uh, co-coordinators, Lieutenant Pastor and Sergeant Malin and I, we train police officers from around Norfolk County, including Brookline. We've trained over 500 officers um, in the crisis intervention team model, which is an evidence-based model of community policing where officers learn to recognize when someone is in a mental health or substance use crisis. We do live role plays where they practice de-escalation skills and slowing things down and making sure people are safe and then connecting them to appropriate resources, whether that's a hospital or community-based services or something else altogether. Um, so that's some of the work I do. Hearing the comments, I, I'm really grateful for this conversation. And I just wanted to say, I completely agree that we need more services and supports for people. Um, however, the failures of our mental health and our other social service systems aren't the fault of the police department. And right now the police are filling in a lot of the gaps in these other systems and helping people in situations where they can't access any other 24 seven support. I would encourage the task forces to look at the reasons why some of these other systems are failing. Um, you know, for example, with the mental health system that I'm most familiar with, health insurance companies reimburse for services at rates that are way lower than for physical health services. Um, you know, I would, I would encourage like the Brookline Mental Health Center to be part of the conversation um, to talk about why, you know, their waiting lists are long for people to access care. Um, if you want to address three minutes in a way that's going to make a difference in the long term. Thank you so much for the time. The next person signed up for public comment is David Eisenberg. David, you've been promoted to a panelist and can share your video and unmute when you're comfortable. Your three minutes will begin. Okay, um, my name is David Eisenberg. I've been a resident of Brookline for 47 years. I've been asked to come to this meeting and uh, make some comments on behalf of the Young Israel of Brookline uh, and the Jewish community. Uh, our feelings generally are of gratitude for the police conduct for the, and for their rapid response and their professionalism. We have not been reading of police misconduct in the tab. In fact, there is much in the tab to reflect on the, the competence of our police department, of which we can be very proud. We are very comfortable that the nationally highlighted cases, sometimes sensationalized, have not happened here. Of course, all programs of all departments should always be open for fiscal review, for a review of their purpose and their need and priorities. But changes that are not proven and lack data should not be entertained. Given that there have been calls for defending police in some places without forethought, even not by, but for those who need those services, some of this attention has to be understood as without any basis whatsoever. We in, uh, in my community are very much aware of the increasing number of anti-Semitic incidents in Massachusetts and value the continued police protection of our local synagogues and temples. Much is not reported in our local press, but is reported in the Jewish community. If one wants to reimagine anything, one has to define with data, with evidence, with proof, what the current reality is, not imagine it. You have to find and define the reality. And one has to present proven suggestions, not hopeful experiments based on notions. If there is any area in Brookline that lacks full services or funding, the solution is to try to find a way to support it, not to weaken another vital service such as the police. Uh, 
thank you very much for your attention. The next person signed up for public comment is Evan Patel. Hi, thank you so Evan. much. Go ahead. Okay, so I believe that uh, reimagining policing in Brookline is extremely crucial for these reasons. Reimagining policing is crucial due to uh, the fact that we need to fit the needs of our community in Brookline and not just any community around the US. Brookline is a certain community and we need to fit, fit these needs. In a study about Brookline policing specifically, it has been shown that pe people of color are disproportionately arrested, stopped, questioned, and have more interactions with, with the police. It is clear that there is a problem of discrimination and profiling here. Some people think the way to solve this problem is further funding police programs such as de-escalation training or, or bias training. De-escalation training was the exact training that officers who murdered George Floyd went through. It has been clear through constant studies that these trainings do not make police any less violent or discriminatory. The only solution to truly change the police is to reform the police into separate forces that are trained to respond to specific crimes and have good training for each of their purposes. I hear a lot of concern about the lack of police to respond to, to domestic violence. To this I say, police have been some of the biggest perpetrators of sexual violence with people under their custody. So it's clear that the police aren't the force we need for this. I believe that we need a specifically trained task force for um, to respond to such an important issue such as domestic violence or other violent crimes, but not the police. Thank you so much. The next person signed up for public comment is Natalia Lina. Hi, thank you so much for having me. And I wasn't going to speak. Uh, my name is Natalia Linas. I'm a mom of three kids, a Brookline Village resident, and I wasn't going to speak because I haven't been following uh, in close detail the work of these two committees. But having listened to people tonight, I thought I would share a little bit of my insights as a public health expert, someone who did her PhD on domestic violence, someone who has worked on mental health initiatives in New York City at the health department in New York City with the NYPD to share a little bit um, about why I do want to reimagine the police force. And I do want us to take this conversation away from this uh, black and white about, you know, the police are good people or they're bad people. Uh, we know from the data at the national level, at the local level, that people of color are more likely to die at the hands of the police. We know from the data that um, people of color are more likely to be surveilled, to be arrested at disproportional rates. And we know that people with mental illness are also more likely. So there is a problem. And that isn't an accusation of the individuals in the Brookline Police Department. We have to step away and think about the structures. And I think that is what the task is um, ahead of us. And um, Annabelle, thank you so much for introducing yourself as a social worker in the police department and highlighting some of the real challenges, including the fact that mental health providers don't follow up with people, that there is a real mental health crisis. But that is what we need to put forward. We need to start thinking where is your best use, Annabelle? If you are in a police department, are you able going to be able to equally take care of um, a black Brookline resident and a white Brookline resident dealing with the same substance use, say, challenge or mental health crisis? I would say that our data at the School of Public Health at Harvard shows that that is not the case. Because if you have um, been treated poorly by the police, you are less likely to show up to seek services that you offer. Similarly, on domestic violence, we know from the data that less than one in five women actually um, look for help by calling the police or someone else. They look to peers, they look to community services. So let's talk about budgeting as a moral exercise. That is what we need to think about our budgets. And let's think about where are we putting our resources and where are we not putting our resources? So I encourage everyone to think about social workers, maybe being in schools, Think about our mental health crisis, think about our substance use crisis, and uh, be open to the idea that reimagining the police does not make us less safe. Reimagining the police actually makes us a healthier community and um, 
you know, I want to be part of that conversation. So I welcome tonight and sorry for speaking without notes, but I wanted to just share some of my thoughts. Thank you. At this time, uh, we have 42 attendees, 43 attendees, and no one has indicated that they would like to make an additional comment. Chair Fernandez and Chair Green, I don't know. Why don't we Hold give on. people a, a few more minutes to come up with some thoughts, uh, see if they, um, you know, see if we get some more comments. Uh, otherwise, you know, probably should close the hearing. All yeah, right, I, it looks like someone is having technical difficulties coming in. Just give me one minute Can and I share? will. Chairman Green, I, I have a statement that I'd like to make before the meeting closes. Okay. This is June Benny, member of the um, reform, uh, Policing Reform Committee. Ready? Okay, yeah. Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, I just wanted to say a couple of things, just generally, um, a little bit about um, myself personally and professionally, um, about my work and my life in Brookline, um, and, and then kind of putting this in the context of national politics, which um, I think we all really need to be focused on for these next four weeks and six days. Um, for those who may not know me, I'd like to introduce myself and put on record my nearly 40 year career as a criminal justice reformer, um, a career that's defined me and of which I am extremely proud. Um, I apologize in advance because some of you have heard me go through my background and have heard these very words. So I'll go through it more quickly than the last time. Um, and and, and uh, June, remember yeah. you can submit your statement to the uh, committee and it'll be available to all the committee members of the two committees. So you don't need to read the entire statement at this moment. Right. If I could just have, you know, three or four minutes. Yes, yeah. Yeah, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I've worked here in the Commonwealth and in New York City where I've held leadership positions as an advocate, an attorney, a policymaker, an administrator, all at the intersections of criminal justice, mental health, public health, and substance use. My work has focused on undoing our country's shameful history of mass incarceration and systemic racism through the criminalization of mental illness, substance use, communicable disease, gender, race, and poverty. In order to affect major systems change, I've proudly worked alongside the ACLU in New York and Massachusetts, the New York City Prisoner Rights Project of Legal Aid, the Massachusetts Prison, Prisoner Legal Services, and every other criminal justice and mental health advocacy group here in New York and nationally. I've been called upon by the Boston Globe Spotlight Team, National Public Radio, the New York Times, and many other publications to speak out as an expert on these issues. I collaborate with advocates in the media as well as with the most ardent activists of criminal justice reform in the Massachusetts State House, in the New York City City Council, um, and in, in the New York State Legislature to fight for change. Suffolk County District Attorney Rachel Rollins um, has called upon me and continues to call on me to weigh in on issues regarding mental illness and the opioid crisis, including how to decriminalize, intervene, and support people with opioid use dis disorders and mental illness who live near the intersection of Mass Ave and Melnia Cost Boulevard, which is also known, um, unfortunately, here in Massachusetts as Methadone Mile. I am viewed as a bridge builder and a boundary spander, spanner between the police, the county jails, the state prisons, the courts, the DAs, the defense bar, the advocacy community, the media and the legislature, because I truly believe in my heart and in my soul that only by working across systems can we make profound and lasting progress on these intractable, intractable problems that are rooted over the course of centuries in our country's history of slavery. I've spent 30 years, 38 years, I wish 30, a little younger um, and less tired, 38 years working on these issues in every jail, house of correction and state and federal prison in Massachusetts, New York City, and many other states throughout the US. And I will proudly hold my record and successes in reforming the criminal justice system alongside anyone's. Some of my proudest achievements have unfolded right here in Brooklyn, a place I've called home on and off since 1978 and where I've chosen to raise my family. Um, my um, five children, um, including a foster son, 
um, and, um, and, and now um, lucky enough to have a son-in-law and a granddaughter here um, who is a second grader at Florence um, uh, Ruffin Ridley. Um, I, also have an, I also have an 11th grader um, at the high school. Um, in 2012, I was recruited by the National Alliance on Mental Illness to start the Criminal Justice Diversion Project, a five-year program to work with police departments throughout the Commonwealth to stop the unnecessary arrest and incarceration of people with mental illness and substance use disorder. I was well aware that nationally people of color and people with mental health conditions are those most likely to be the victims of police shootings, and I immersed myself in the 2015 seminal work of President Obama's 21st Century Policing Project. Project, excuse me. The partnership between NAMI and the Brookline Police Department has resulted in an evolved police culture in, in, in terms of their response to be people with behavioral health disorders, led by the uh, fierce efforts of Lieutenant Jen Pastor, Sergeant Chris Malin, um, more recently, Annabelle Lane, who worked with me previously at NAMI, and many others under the leadership of retired Chief Dan O'Leary. The Brookline Police Department is now viewed as a statewide leader in police interactions with people and families with mental health, substance use, and domestic violence, and have been awarded a large grant over the past seven years to train 100% of their officers in the 40-hour crisis intervention uh, team training program, which is nationally and internationally considered the gold standard in policing. The police department now trains officers in other police departments throughout Nor Norfolk and Suffolk County, including those in Boston. Minutes. Newton, Wellesley, Needham, Milton, Braintree, Walpole, Norwood, Westwood, Dedham, Franklin, Duxbury, Weymouth, Hull, Quincy, Weston, as well as Boston EMS, the BU Police Department, the Department of Correction, the Boston Police Department, and others. The Brookline Police uh, June, Department- June, could you uh, wrap up? We'll, we'll okay. stipulate as, your, as to your expertise. No, I was, well, now I was talking about Brookline, but I, I will now bring it sort of more personal. Um, after steering clear of town politics since um, 1978, when I first moved here to go to BU Law School, like many New Yorkers, I, um, I recently applied to Raul's Committee to Reimagine Policing um, because criminal justice reform is my life's work. And I was encouraged to bring my statewide and national work um, home to here in Brookline. And it felt um, like, like um, a contradiction to be doing this work elsewhere and not in my own hometown. Um, I was somewhat shocked and disappointed that I was not selected to, to be on Raul's reimagining committee um, because I was wondering whether there were really people who applied who had more than 38 years of experience as a criminal justice performer. Um, I was thrilled on that same day that I was rejected by Raul to get a call from Bernard Green um, inviting me to join yet a different police reform committee. Um, feel, my feelings were still hurt and um, my ego was still bruised. I, resisted since um, I'm really not a police operations expert. I'm a reimagining re police person. Um, I, I, um, I knew Bernard's name. I voted for him, but I did not know Bernard at all. Um, likewise with Raul. I knew his name, did not know him at all, but I voted for him. Um, I've been privileged. Jenny, yes? You've just reached uh, six minutes, and we do have two other public comments that have just come up. I would actually just like about another minute if that would be okay to finish off. Okay, but please, please wrap up. Okay. I won't talk about how privileged I am to know you then. <laughs> I'll say that at our next meeting. <laughs> um, what I would like to say is we have four weeks and six days to a referendum on our democracy. We cannot get bogged down and distracted by the left okay. eating our own. Okay. Um, we must be uh, united in defeating fascism in this country. Okay. And and we will no longer have the luxury of arguing among ourselves if we don't. I would like to declare a truce right now among our two committees and among ourselves until November 4th. I move uh, respectfully to hold joint meetings until that time to define areas of redundancy between the committees and to eliminate redundant work and redundant okay. meetings and okay. nastiness and vitriol. We are out of time and we have no time to waste on, on, on wasting our time on, on, on doing each other's work in the same community. Okay. We can continue to respectfully agree to disagree when we celebrate a Biden-Harris win on November 4th. A very democracy is at stake and we are being led like sheep to their slaughter and playing right into radical rights and Trump's playbook by fighting among ourselves. Please okay. stop. Please stop the attacks on me, on Bernard and on my family and let's do the important work as one committee. If New York City 
with 36,000 police officers, Chicago with 13,138 police officers, LAPD with 9,974 police officers. Respectfully, we have respect. Can respect have one police, this might be my last work on these committees, so I'm, I'm, I'm respectfully asking your forbearance. If those, if New York, LA, and Chicago can have one police reform committee, so can Brookline, Massachusetts, with 137 police officers. This okay. is absurd. Um, this is also okay. very personal to me because Amy Takanami is my foster son's sister, and this is this is tearing a rift in the fabric of my family. And I have a very different read than Amy does on the work that has been done by the police department with her dad, who is a member of our family as well, and who has been cared for by the Brookline police, which such um, uh, I, I love and, 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 and devotion that I would be happy to tell his story on behalf of him at another okay. time. Thank you so much. We, we, Thank you so much. It. I appreciate doing the work with you guys. I will see you again on November 4th and hopefully celebrate okay. a democratic yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you. <laughs> okay. The next person signed up for public comment is Hugo Iwolono. You've been promoted to a panelist and your three minutes will begin when you're ready. You can unmute and share your video if you're comfortable. Hi, can everyone hear me? All right, so uh, first of all, I would like to just uh, extend my support to the uh, Reimagining Police Committee. I think they're doing some excellent work and policing does need to be, re does need to be reimagined in Brookline and all over the USA. Uh, I'd also like to invite my white fellow residents of Brookline to essentially get out of their bubble and understand where other people in Brookline might be coming from when it comes to interactions with police. You know, I understand as a man and as a US citizen that, for, for example, we have a problem with sexual assault and domestic violence towards women in this country. It doesn't affect me, but I don't say to myself, well, you know, it doesn't affect me, so, that, so therefore there is no problem. You know, if, if there's a problem in America affecting anyone, then it's a problem for all Americans and we shall deal with it and address it instead of saying, well, it doesn't affect me, so I want things to, say, to stay the same because I'm good. Uh, I'd also like to share a story from a few years ago uh, a few years ago, I was working a job in Somerville, which made me, and I had to commute from Brooklyn Village to Somerville for it. And one uh, late afternoon, apparently there was some sort of violent crime committed here in Brookline. Uh, apparently the suspect in question was an African-American male. And because of that, I didn't feel safe coming back to my apartment in Brookline until the suspect was caught because my fear was as an African-American male myself, I would be seen by police and automatically be deemed the suspect and arrested, beaten, shot to death, whatever. So for my own safety, I didn't feel comfortable coming back to my apartment until I heard that the, sus the suspect was caught. And even now today in 2020, if God forbid I come home to my apartment and the apartment's been broken into, my roommates are found beaten up or whatever, I would not feel comfortable calling the police because I feel like there's a possibility that they would see me as a big black man and immediately think that I was a suspect and just rush to judgment and do God knows who, God knows what to me, shoot me down, choke me out or do whatever, just assuming that I, I was a perpetrator. And most of the comments that I've heard tonight don't do anything to alleviate those fears that I would have because it's all been essentially just people saying how, again, they feel comfortable with the police, nothing bad has ever happened to them. They apparently don't know anyone that's had any bad experiences with the Brooklyn police. And so in their minds, everything is, is fine. Well, again, like, you know, I could, you know, put a bag over my head and say, oh, well, I don't see any domestic violence or violence towards women, so everything's fine. So I think that's something that, again, the residents of Brooklyn need to understand that just because it's not happening to them or just because it may not be happening to anyone that they know, it doesn't mean that it's not a problem. And the police, and if people feel comfortable with the police and feel that, and feel that the police protect them, that's great. The problem is that not everybody feels that way. and. You know, if we want to have a community where everyone is represented, then everyone needs to feel that way. And the police need to make sure that they're putting forth the effort to make sure that all presidents of Brooklyn feel that the police are out to protect them. Uh, thank you. 
Thank you. The next person signed up for public comment is Ryan Black. Hi, everyone. Um, I wasn't going to speak tonight. Oh, sorry. You might want to. So yeah, I wasn't going to speak tonight, but I, I felt like I had to considering how unnerving it was that so many people showed up tonight to say the police department is great, that nothing is wrong, that, quote, I've never had a bad experience with the Brookline PD, end quote, and to paint a just a wildly inaccurate, inaccurate picture of Brookline and Boston. And I'm referring to that, like the implications that like we're on the verge of being a war zone, that Brooklyn is besieged on three sides by the quote unquote very dangerous city of Boston. I mean, we all know what that means, right? When people say that, we all know what they're really saying. And and of course, you know, the underlying message of what a lot of people said is like, uh, you know, the Brooklyn PD, oh, they're the thin blue line holding back a wave of violent crime from enveloping our town. And I think just both the members of both committees here and the residents of a town as a whole have to step back and just realize like that way of looking at the world, that like that way of looking at our town is just a fat heaping pile of bullshit. It's, it's just racist, it's classist, and we all know it's not accurate. And so think better than that, you're all smarter than that. And so I just like to end by saying, I fully echo and underscore everything Hugo just said that the residents of Brookline, its elected officials have an obligation to get out of their bubble. Thank you. The next person signed up for public um, comment is Danelle O'Neill. Danelle, you've been promoted to a panelist. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Donald O'Neill Sr., um, town meeting member, advisory committee member. Um, the, I just have a couple of statements. Um, one is I, I, I appreciate what, what uh, Hugo said and how Everyone needs to be represented here in town. Um, and the fair, the real fair that uh, people like us have that live in this town is real. Um, I, you know, I didn't move here. I lived here my whole life. And, you know, I've had good experiences with the police officers, bad, you know, bad experiences. Um, but I've grown to to build a relationship with them, with the police officers. Um, our, our police are important. We, um, we need them in town, like it or not. And I feel the only way that, that we can come together as, as a community and, you know, and, and make sure everyone in the communities is, is is okay and comfortable living in their community is is reimagining and in, in the in these committees and taking steps to um, address the issues that constituents have here in town um, I agree with the I, I I applaud the committees I have no issue with the police reform reimagining committees um, nothing like that I, it's it's good for the town it's good for us to have these conversations and um, work things out. I, I, I feel for June. I, I, I hear you, June. And um, I, I feel you just, I, I don't know if it was an uncomfortable moment for you at that meeting, um, but I have no problem with the committees at all. I just want, I just want to be clear on that. I, I am disheartened by the actions that I saw by the, by the chair. Um, and it's personal to me. Um, that, and, and, and it's personal to, to a bunch of people who feel like we don't matter in town. Um, uh, Brookline police officers have stepped it up. 
they have agreed, you know, uh, they, they've been working hard on CBAs and, and, you know, body cameras are coming soon. They agreed to it. They even added GPS to the body cameras, which was amazing. So, you know, our police officers are trying. I, I, I understand that I hear it. These committees are, this committee is important. Um, I appreciate it. And um, like I said, my only issue was is the actions that happened at, at that meeting um, with the chair. Um, my second, thank you. My, my, my last statement is um, that, uh, that, that security station at the high school, um, I forget the gentleman's name who was speaking, um, but that needs to be moved as soon as possible, please. Um, I didn't know about that, and it personally it it, it hits me because the cat the the um, groups of the people that you were speaking about is my junior. My junior is uh, around there. I, I so um, I just want to thank everyone for their comments. Everyone who spoke earlier, uh, I, I appreciate the the transparency and. And, and to come together, you know, because this is what the town needs. Um, this is what the town, this is what our town deserves. This is what the people, this is what the constituents deserve. So I just want to thank everyone for coming together. Um, I, I agree with June about the joint meetings. That should be, that should have, that should be happening. Um, thank you. Um, have a good night, everyone. Thanks, Janelle. The next person said. Evan, you're muted. Thanks, Alexander. Alice Thompson, you are the next person signed up for public comment. Um, hi, everyone. I wasn't gonna speak or whatever today, um, and I'm not super educated on this. I've like been following it, but not super closely, but I was just really, really terrified by so many of the claims that previous speakers have made. And I just really want to emphasize, you know, your experience as a white person in this town, like a privileged white person in this town, it really does not mean that is the experience for everyone. Like, really, just think about yourself. Think about the racism that that's ingrained in your mind that you're enforcing. Think about how your experience is so much different from lots of other people and people of color in the town. And, you know, your positive experience with the police, that really, that doesn't cancel out someone's negative experience. And your experience with the police as a white person is so different from... The experience of someone of someone of color and obviously I can't speak to that as well as some people can a few as a person of color can but um I just think that you really need to be thinking about that and you know you really need to step out of your bubble and recognize that like you know a lot of the a lot of these um a, the, a lot of your views and also just like your experiences you're not the only it's not the only experiences you know your 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 ego or you know your your family experience a lot of them, they're not relevant. A lot of time, it's you really need to be thinking about other people. And yeah, I mean, Ugo and Natalia both made just like amazing points. I don't have much else to say, but I just, I really want to say I fully support the reimagining committee and just really try to think about the people, the other people who are, whose lives are at stake here. Thank you. The next person signed up for public comment is Anne Greenwald. Anne, you can unmute and share your video. Hello, everyone. My name is Anne Greenwald. I'm a town meeting member from Precinct 8. Um, I just wanted to share a story that I had um, and that will highlight to me why we need to reimagine policing in Brookline. Uh, several years ago, we were privileged enough to host a young man from Nicaragua who came here to learn about fair trade coffee. He worked in a fair trade coffee um, farm in Nicaragua, and they wanted to teach him sort of the US end of the business. The first thing he had to do when he came here was take English classes. I found him an English tutor that lived about a half a mile away from me. And um, his second, day, his first morning here, after um, his first night here, he, um, I sent him off to his English class, which was a half a mile away. It was 9.30 in the morning, um, broad daylight, and he was stopped by the police. Um, he was, he did not speak English. He is a brown skinned man from Nicaragua and he 
didn't have his papers with him because I naively never thought that he needed to have his papers with him as he traveled um, down the street in my neighborhood. Uh, I, I was able to, he did have my phone number and they called, the police called me and I verified who he was. And I asked them why they had picked him up. First, I asked if they had anyone on the police force who spoke Spanish. And at that time, which was several years ago, they said, no, they did not. They said it's someone who um, maybe spoke Portuguese. So that to me was also sort of um, a red flag that they didn't have anybody who spoke Spanish, which is a pretty common language in around this area. So then I said, why did you pick him up? And they said, well, there have been some break-ins in the neighborhood. And I basically said, if I had been walking down the street at 9.30 in the morning, would you have picked me up? And I got no response. And I feel like that, that sort of highlights the issue that people have been talking about, that it's a completely different experience for me as a white woman to be talking about these things versus some, a person of color, and especially also someone who doesn't speak the language to um, have an interaction with the police that was very terrifying for him. And he no longer wanted to go to that English class because of having to walk across the town. Thank you. Thank you. The next person signed up is Evelyn Ophir. Evelyn, you can unmute and start your video when you're comfortable. Okay, did I unmute? You did. Okay. Okay. Um, I don't see that I'm on. Oh, okay. Hi, I wasn't planning on speaking uh, really, but I just have one. Uh, my name is Evelyn Ophir. I've been living here for over 35 years. And I was at a meeting for criminal justice at my temple. And there was the issue of race in, I guess, the fire department or the police. And I thought, oh, I'll just go to my cafe and have a cup of coffee. And I asked the cashier, who's African-American, the sweetest guy, I said, oh, have you had any problems with the police? And I'm completely, completely clueless. He said, yeah, you know, I was, and he didn't say it like me, but he said, I was on my bike. I was coming right along Harvard Street. This was the Pete's Cafe at uh, Coolidge Corner. And he said, they stopped me and they asked me, I was on my bike. They asked me to get off and they asked me for my, for my identification. And they were just, and I'm like, what? Cause like, I'm like the woman before me. I had no experience with the police in terms of things like that. And, and I said, you're kidding. And I said, I said, and how did you got, you didn't get upset? He said, well, you know, my, my grandmother taught me that if the police stop me, then I have to be nice. And otherwise I'm gonna have problems. So I wanna say this was about three or four years ago. It, things could be different now. That was the story that I heard. And I, you know, it wasn't that somebody told me about somebody else. It was just, it was relayed to me and I just felt that I have to tell this story because it made me so sad that somebody, the sweetest, sweetest guy that, that I have beautiful interactions with told me that story. So thank you very much. And I, and I, and I wanna beg you, I wanna beg you guys on the committees, listen to people. You don't need to argue whether it's true or not. If someone says this happened to them, believe them. They wouldn't say it if they didn't happen. We don't need to argue. We just need to listen. And I just will say in the Jewish tradition of Shema, to Shema Yisrael, to listen. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Evelyn. The next person signed up for I, public I'm comment. I'm really very passionate about this and very sad at the same time that, that, that we have, we're Brookline. We're supposed to be progressive and come together as one town with loving kindness towards everybody. Please, you guys, make it happen. Thank you, Evelyn. The next person signed up for public comment is Tommy Vitolo. Tommy, you can unmute and share your video when you're comfortable. Thank you to both committees. 
and especially to Chairs Green and Fernandez for taking on this incredibly difficult and important work. My name is Tommy Vitolo. I live on University Road and I am a state representative. To that end, I and my colleagues owe our community and our Commonwealth a police reform bill. I'm disappointed that we haven't gotten one out of conference committee yet and remain hopeful that we will get a bill out and signed by the governor by the end of this year. To the committee members on both of Brookline's policing committees, you must open yourselves to stretching what's possible beyond what you initially imagined. But all committee members don't have an equal obligation. I recognize that this is difficult to hear. Those who are the most comfortable, most powerful, most safe, must demonstrate the most flexibility, the most openness. The work of your committees over the next few months will not outright solve policing problems in Brookline, nor should your work over the next few months be expected to do so. Please, committee members, focus on making tangible, measurable, near-term progress so that people of color feel just as safe while in Brookline. Thank you. Thank you, Tommy. The next person signed up for public comment is Emma Nash. Emma, you can unmute and share your video when you're comfortable. Hi. Um, I wasn't going to speak tonight, but it turns out that I can be moved. Um, I wanted to return to the topic of school resource officers and relate um, an experience that I did not have, but that I remember um, from my own sophomore year at Brooklyn High School six years ago. Um, and I was not in the room for this. This is something that I learned about secondhand, um, but it was widely discussed in my grade. Um, when I was a senior at the high school, I remember an incident where there were two girls in the classroom and they got into an argument over whether or not one of the girls had, um, I'm trying to, what's the right word here? Cheated, gotten the other girl's boyfriend to cheat with her, but th that one of the girl's boyfriend had cheated on, on her with this other girl. And that girl took out the, that student's phone and tried to show the, the class her text messages. And somebody called the police and the police came to the classroom and arrested her because apparently it's a crime to show private data from someone's phone to, to members of the classroom. Um, again, this happened six years ago, so I don't, I, can be, I could be getting certain details wrong, especially since I was not in the room. Um, but at the time I was pretty shocked by this. Um, and I was shocked for two reasons. The first is that I did not know that, that that was a crime and it sounded really petty to me. And the second was that to that point, I had had myself very good experiences with school resource officers in Brookline schools. Although of course I had heard from friends of mine who are people of color that they had, that they had felt profiled by police officers in the town. I knew the school resources officers in Brookline schools and it had never occurred to me that they would do something so petty. Um, so I say this, to make the point that I am now um, a master's student in education, um, which means I spend a lot of time reading about how it doesn't, about how the effect of having school resource officers in schools um, is cumulatively, even when those officers are good, nice people, that incidents like that one increase, um, that there are more of them. So I just wanted to respond to, I'm sure that the school resource officers that, the, that Brookline High has now are nice, lovely people, but systemically, um, it seems to me that we would be doing a lot better by having, rather than trying to turn those officers into social workers and stripping them of um, all of the things that officers are supposed to do, like make arrests, um, if we hired people who were actually just social workers or were actually just mental health counselors um, and who didn't have to be retrained and reformed into something that they are not. Um, Thank you very much. Thanks, Emma. The next person signed up for public comment is Ryan Carvalho. You'd like to get the well set? Yep. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Ryan. I did not want to speak because naturally I was worried that someone on looking could take notice of my name and then later use it against me. I have per personally witnessed countless situations in which the police have abused their power. I have been in the back of police a police car getting punched in the face for doing literally nothing wrong, and I would gladly expand on the situation given the time. 
And although I am fairly new to Brookline and the anecdotal evidence may not apply specifically to this town or any town I have been in, I have faced issues such as this. Whether you are familiar with the Stanford prison experiments or the way that power corrupts, I believe that is an issue in all communities in which not only should the people be policed, but the police be policed. Things like immunity for those who clearly get, go against policy and commit crimes on the other side of the aisle is clearly a double standard and unfair. To apply such clear cognitive dissonance as to state that our police, because you have never experienced an issue, is unique compared to all other police departments in the country facing the exact same issue is a tired excuse and clearly obviously a blind eye, a blind spot for many of you. This is simply not an issue of policing in Brookline, but an issue of policing in America as it reflects a smaller grassroots solution to a larger problem in the same way that affluent communities now face addiction the same way as poor ones. As a therapist, I am familiar with things such as addiction, and I have never once in my life heard of somebody being referred by the police to a social worker in the police department. And I could furthermore write a lengthy rebuttal on pretty much everything that has been said positive about the police, but I know we don't have time for that. Police are trained for punishment and retribution, not rehabilitation. One great idea that I am a proponent of in the community policing in which the police community is that they get to know people better through different functions and sources. As when you get to know a person beyond a piece of paper or what represents, represents them at their worst moment, it will deescalate this danger in the situation. Another great solution would be to reallocate funds to those who deserve it. Police cannot be warriors for situations like rape and murder and also be expected to take care of things of traffic offenses. And they are spread too thin even in America where we have an over abundance of different types of police forces. Furthermore, in situations such as domestic violence, the police are required to arrest the supposed perpetrator. And I have had individual conversations with them in which they tell me they're no longer even allowed to investigate it. It just goes up to the decisions of the courts. This means in situations where two brothers may have gotten into a slightly physical altercation, maybe a push, the police have to arrest both of them and now they have possibly a really bad record. I know my time is running short, but these are just a couple of things to think about for you who are clearly operating off of emotions rather than the facts and logics. And I try to stay out of anecdotal evidence because it doesn't apply to the larger situation. I have also tried to record police, which is why I think it would be great for them to have body cams that are monitored, that they are monitored by those not in the force, which seem to be strongly, the police seem to be strongly against because they don't follow policy. And obviously even trained to lie to get you admit things which you may not have even done on the larger scale. You have Thank 30 you seconds. Time. Oh, great. The next person signed up for public comment is Tal Kennedy. Tal, you've been promoted to a panelist and can unmute and share your video when you're comfortable. Hi, thank you so much. Um, so like a lot of other people that just spoke, I was not planning on speaking at all. So this may be a bit messy um, and I'm sorry about that. But yeah, so I just wanna start off like kind of like what everyone's been saying, um, not everyone, but recently. Um, that like maybe like as a white person, it's like really hard to see that um, black Americans, black people in Brookline have like some really bad experiences with the police. I myself have heard like a lot of stories of, of black um, teenagers even being followed by the police with no reason at all. And um, you know, a lot of the people that just talked shared a lot of their own experiences. So I think it's just well, one, it's important to realize that um, your, your experience um, specifically to white people um, may not be the experience um, that a lot of others face um, or that some others face. And yeah, I also wanna um, talk a bit um, about just how the idea of police, like our current system of, poli of policing is based heavily on the system of, the system of power. And I think, um, at least in my opinion, our current system of policing gives oh, way too much power uh, to the to any individual in the police, um, it gives them. I mean, I'm sure you've heard it, um, the saying, but it's like it gives them um, the ability to be judged during an executioner in any specific scenario. Um, and I, even if no one specific um, policeman or policewoman has bad intentions or is intentionally racist or some things like that, things like implicit bias and other um, other reasons could just cause scenarios that you know we, we don't want to happen so I think yeah <laughs> sorry this is a bit um disorganized but yeah I just want to agree with everyone else and not everyone else um I just want to agree with but um the people the few of the people have said recently that um yeah the police need reform thanks pal the next person signed up for public comment is Sasha Calvert 
Sasha, you've been promoted to a panelist. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So I also was not planning on speaking tonight. And I just want to take a second to talk about the fact that so many people who were not planning on speaking tonight have found the need to speak because they've been so disappointed with what they've heard. Um, I am going to speak from my own experience, from my own identity as a white woman. And I'm going to say that I am disappointed with how members of these of specifically with the reform committee have been victimizing themselves and weaponizing their race in order to stop stop the reimagining committee from reimagining policing in Brookline. As Tall just said, as many other supporters of the reimagining committee have said, this is much bigger than your personal victimization. This is much bigger than your personal experiences. And this is like, this simply is not about you. I'm disgusted, truthfully, I'm disgusted to see the way that certain members of this committee have been victimizing themselves in order to try and stop this agenda. It is disappointing, it is frustrating, and it is in no way representative of how we as a town should be functioning. We are, as a town should be looking out for one another, every single person. And I am really upset to see with how many members of the reform, the police reform board have been dealing with what has been brought forth tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Sasha. At this time, there are 34 attendees. We do have a panelist with their hand raised if uh, the chairs want to address that at this time, uh, but there are no further comments in the Q&A and no members of the public have used the hand raise feature to indicate they'd like to make another comment. I mean, this is mainly a listening session, not an interactive session. But what do you think, um, Raul? Do you want to? I think um, allowing from? one of the I think allowing one of the our committee members to speak opened the door for this. So I feel like um, we should, um, you know, who's that? If oh, June. That they really need to say something. Then oh yeah, that there. was um, yeah. and she was in the queue. So okay, um, Devin, who wants to speak? Raj has his hand raised. I uh, have un I've asked you to unmute Raj and you can begin your comments when you're ready. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, my name is Raj Dehanda, uh, almost a 50 year resident of uh, Brookline. Um, so I would start out by asking a simple question. If you had a doctor and the doctor had a thousand patients and five of them had ended up with serious issues because of what the doctor did. Would you be talking so much about the 995 or would you be wanting to know more about the five? Uh, my guess is the five is what you want to know more about because you expect the doctor to be uh, doing uh, his job, his or her job, and the patient's doing well. So that is the way I think of the police department. Uh, vast amount of the police are wonderful people and they do their job, but it is the not so uh, wonderful people. And I'm gonna go quickly through three experiences I've had, all of them around, Brook around Coolish Corner. In one experience, I was crossing Beacon Street uh, uh, walk, a crosswalk, and there was a, what I thought a dangerous condition. A policeman was in the middle of the street and uh, doing a detail work for gas company. Uh, and I said to the policeman that there was a dangerous condition. Could he do something about it? He said to me, that he was taking care of the uh, man in the, the gas person. And he, I said to him, but he's in the manhole, not much you can do. Uh, and he looked at me and he said, you should go back to where you came from. He said, you should go back to where you came from. Uh, second incident, one late, uh, evening, I was driving my red Jaguar 
uh, at the corner of Babcock and Harvard, and I was wearing sweatpants and sweatshirt. Uh, I turned on Harvard and a police car jumped out of the formation on Harvard Street and followed me within six inches of my car, egging me to break the speed limit and I wouldn't do it. So he, he had no basis to stop me. And he kept following me till I got to the Brighton Brookline boundary, then he broke off. I went to the police station and asked for an explanation. Uh, first, they said that he was just following me. Then after I kept pushing, uh, the officer on the desk came back and said, oh, we know what happened. Okay, tell me. He said, there is a stolen red Jaguar your model with five digits on the license plate that match the six digits. Think about that. You have a better chance of winning or almost the same chance of winning the lottery tomorrow. Third incident, trying to get into my parking lot behind Nina's, uh, I was stopped and I came within a second of being shot because I wanted to come into my own parking lot. And I told the police officer who was blocking me. So anyone who says there's been wonderful experiences, I agree there have been wonderful experiences. Vast number of them are. But the real question is, what happens to situations like mine and many others that have been recited? And that's where the work of these committees needs to focus. Is police department good? It is good, but the, it needs to be far better than what it is. Thank you. Thank you, Raj. At this time, there are 36 attendees. What do you think, Nina? Yeah. Okay. Um, no one else, um, Devin, indicating that they'd like to comment? Just taking a look in the Q&A and the attendee list at this time, no one is using the hand raise feature or uh, send a chat in the Q&A to indicate they'd like to speak. Um, I, I, I recognize now that um, there may be other members of either the task force or the committee who would like to express sentiments. Um, you know, I'm also mindful, um, you know, we've had two members now from the Committee on Policing Reforms share their views. Uh, you know, we do have public meetings where I, you know, I know that the task force to reimagine policing in Brookline this Friday is a part of our agenda on Friday is to discuss the comments that we heard tonight. Um, so we'll be having that discussion then. I don't know that we need to have it right now. Um, so respectfully yeah. I, i'd like to suggest um otherwise this may devolve into a in, into a <laughs> a public dialogue that that uh that doesn't need to take place at this moment but i don't know um bernard do you have a th other thoughts on that well our committee is also going to be discussing the uh, hearing at, at a meeting on october 7 which i think is next week um so yeah i, I don't think we need to um you know have that discussion here uh, we, people need to digest what they've heard, uh, think about it, and uh, at our discussion at the, um, next week's meetings or for the uh, task force this week, uh, we can have a discussion fully informed by you know, what we've heard from people tonight. Great. Um, if we're closing the hearing, I just wanted to, to um, just say a couple words if, um, if that's all right. Um, and I imagine, Bernard, you might want to as well. Um, you know, I, I do want to just respond to a couple of things and just to, to, to get everyone on the same page. It's not about, um, I take everyone's comments and, and we're going to sort of take that into consideration as we move forward. I do want to say this, there is no Raul's committee or Bernard's committee. These are select board committees and task forces. They were voted on unanimously, both of them, by the five select board members. Um, so there is no such thing as Raul's committee or Bernard's committee. These are, these are our, our, our committees of folks that have come together 
Bernard and I happen to chair these committees, um, but, um, but they're really good people um, that have come together to try to, um, to figure out very tough problems. Uh, and and um, I'll leave that there. Uh, I will say also, um, folks talked about proposals. There are no proposals right now from the, coming from the task force. Um, our work is just getting started, frankly. We just started breaking into subcommittees to actually um, do the investigatory work that's necessary to produce proposals. Um, I'll be, uh, in mid-October, I think we're scheduled uh, to sort of report on our activities. I won't have, frankly, a ton to report at that early stage, but I'll report on where we are, such as it is. I, I doubt that we'll be putting forward proposals at that at that point, perhaps later on. Um, but what I will say is that you know th that this this body is meeting the charge that was set out for it, which is to explore alternative models to public safety. Um, and so what I what I encourage you all to do is to watch the task force work. As I mentioned at the top, we meet every Friday as a full task force. All of our meetings to date are all recorded. You can go back and watch it. Um, and you know I, I'd encourage folks to actually watch those meetings and then please do um, critique us on what it is that we're doing. Um, but, 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 you know, if, if you're just watching what's happening on the national news or just watching, you know, um, just, you know, hearing words like defund and stuff like that and responding to those concepts, that's, that's not really responding to the work that we're doing. I think if you tune in, you're going to see some really serious, thoughtful um, deliberations going on. Um, and so I encourage you, please, to tune in. Um, you know, we know that um, that many people are happy with and feel safe under the current state of affairs. And I don't want to change that for you. I don't think anyone wants you to feel less safe. By the way, those of us engaging in this work, we don't want to feel less safe. Um, what what we want is to make sure that everyone feels as safe and happy as many of the people that express that sentiment tonight. We want to make sure that everyone in our community feels that way. Um, you know, I, I'm mindful of, of two comments that I heard tonight. Um, one was um, from Alice Thompson that said, your positive experience does not cancel out someone else's negative experience. Uh, and to really think about, um, like, you know, I too have had many positive experiences in this community, um, but my work is about understanding um, the experience of those who haven't. Um, and so I'd encourage you to engage with us in that work and to support us in that work, because I, I think most people would agree um, that we want to make sure that, that everyone is having positive experiences here. Um, the other comment was by State Representative Tommy Vitolo, um, who said, uh, I believe the most powerful and safe must demonstrate the most openness and flexibility, um, and really did encourage us to step into this work and to be willing to hear alternative proposals. Uh, I'll just say this, there is a very high bar in this community to changing just about anything, and certainly a very high bar to, um, to, to reallocating resources, to eliminating programs. Um, it requires exhaustive public engagement with the select board, with potentially the school committee as, as it relates to, to issues related to the schools, um, town meeting, uh, and, and other bodies. And so, um, no changes will happen like that. Um, no changes will happen under the cover of darkness. Um, there will be exhaustive public engagement for any changes come forward. You, you may like that or you may not like that depending on your view about this issue, um, but that is the way um, things currently work here in Brookline. So you can expect that you'll hear a lot more about these issues and that you'll have more, many more opportunities to comment on them uh, and frankly critique them uh, if, uh, if, um, if that's something that you want to do. And so um, I, I'll, just, I'll just end by, by saying, I encourage you, please, please, please do follow our work, do comment on it, do send um, emails about what you hear at those meetings uh, and what you see, you know, the, the work that you see us do at those meetings, it's only going to make us better. Um, and for all the members of the task force, um, I'd encourage you to approach um, any critiques of our work in that way. Uh, because ultimately, um, if we are going to produce um, viable, workable, um, thoughtful proposals um, that we would like to see enacted, um, we're going to need to have community support to do that um, because of the nature of the structures of our, of our government. Um, so um, I, I'd encourage you as, 
as, um, as I'm sure there will be further critiques of our work, that that's actually part of the natural process of us getting better and producing better proposals. So please bring it on. Um, we'd love to hear more from members of the public on this. Thank you very much for everybody that spoke tonight. It's been helpful, okay. thank you. Yeah, let, let me just add, um, you know, we've heard a lot of, um, of comments from people, both at this hearing as well as uh, in, in our emails over the last uh, few weeks regarding policing. Um, we should not, because our experiences uh, have been positive, uh, assume that everyone's experiences uh, have been as positive as, as ours, whether we're white or black. Um, however, it's also important not to use the phrase people of color as if it's, a uni it's, it's uh, the experiences of everyone who fits within that category. I mean, acknowledge the fact that you know, many people have had uh, positive experiences and maybe we should figure out why some have had positive and some have had negative, but we don't want to give the impression uh, to, for example, young black kids uh, like my son, that uh, if he walks into Brookline, necessarily he's going to be stopped by the police uh, and abused. Uh, we don't want to give the impression that every black person coming through Brookline uh, is going to be abused by the police to uh, the outside world because it's just not an accurate uh, description of uh, our situation. It really undermines our ability to address uh, those uh, uh, experiences uh, that are that some people have that are negative. Uh, so you know that's I think that's you know from the standpoint of you know our method methodology of approaching uh, some of these issues that that's uh, something that I, I think is important. Uh, I, I think that we've heard a lot tonight. I'm, I'm glad that uh, we spent the time after uh, the first group of people had finished uh, or had uh, made their statements to take some additional uh, comments. Uh, they've been very helpful. A lot of people uh, didn't intend to speak and, and decided to uh, put in their uh, viewpoints because they didn't feel that uh, their views or other views were ad adequately represented in the earlier discussion. That's great. Uh, the more information, the more data we have, the better. So um, I understand Karen that there's one, one other person who has raised their hand. Yes, I've yeah. promoted Eddie Stromfeld from the attendee list. Eddie, you can unmute and share your video when you're comfortable. Oh, great. I didn't realize I actually got on. Hi, I'm Eddie, he, him, his, uh, Precinct 10. Um, and very brief comments I wanted to make tonight just uh, to sort of address some things that popped up. And I just think uh, I wanted to just comment on sort of the phenomena that occurred tonight with uh, all the folks who had no intention of speaking but found themselves compelled to after hearing sort of the earlier proceedings uh, during this meeting. Uh, and I just think it's important to note the sort of inherent asymmetry of power in asking people to publicly speak on negative experiences with police. The fact that many people uh, might have felt intimi too intimidated to publicly talk about those kinds of experiences out of a well-founded uh, fear of retaliation by police, something that's also been discussed about you know, meetings that have occurred in person. Um, so it's, I think it's important that we acknowledge that there are many, many voices we weren't able to hear tonight for very valid reasons, and to also acknowledge the bravery of those who did choose to share uh, for the sake of our community. Um, so I think it's important to note that. And I just also want to offer my own perspective as a social worker um, that I think one of the main ways to address the way that uh, if our field is undervalued or underfunded is to begin by shifting money away from bloated police departments and, and towards the more meaningful sort of roots of crime, which is a lack of housing, lack of uh, um, ed education, jobs, food, um, the sorts of things, healthcare that we think uh, everyone um, should have a right to. Um, so I think it's important to note that uh, not every social worker is so enthusiastic about collaboration with police and some of us actively oppose it. Uh, thank you. Okay, unless there are any other uh, comments from the public, I'd like to close this meeting. Devin, do we have anyone in, do have anyone in the queue? At this time, there are 31 attendees and no one has indicated they would like to make a comment in the Q&A or use the hand raise feature. Okay, great. I see there's a lot of questions in the chat room. Um, let's see, mainly people have their hands raised. Uh, anyway, okay, great. Um, Raul, do you want to close this meeting out?
Sure thing. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate yeah. you all for your time and attention. And thanks to all uh, the members of the, the, the reform and reimagining groups. Um, we know that this is in addition um, to everything else you've got going on in your lives. And so thank you for t sharing your time and talent uh, in this work. And, um, and we'll make sure that, um, that we make it worth your time. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, also for me, thank you for spending two hours uh, listening to the public. Uh, comments, uh, suggestions, criticisms. Uh, we need to make sure that we absorb that, uh, absorb them and, and understand uh, them. And uh, we'll be discussing them in the committees uh, at, at our next meetings. So with that, meeting's over. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night.